getting started. Everyone, welcome. Thanks for joining us. My name is Robert. I'll be your host. This is Smithsonian Black and African American Art Part Two of Two. Without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. So some of the artists we'll be talking about in our program tonight are James Vandersee, Richmond Barthay, William Henry Johnson, Romare Bearden, Malvin Gray Johnson, Earl Richardson, Huey Lee Smith, Elier Couture, Jacob Lawrence, Gordon Parks, Micheline Thomas, Amy Sherald, and Kehinde Wiley, among others, just to name a few. And the reason why I like to talk about and discuss and study American art is because it is a great uh, kind of conductor to learn about American history. So there's a lot of correlation between American history and culture and American art. And when you kind of learn about one, you can end up learning about the other. So let's go ahead and get started with some of these artists. All right, so our first artist we're gonna be talking about is a photographer named James Vanderzee. And here are a couple examples of his work. James Vanderzee was born in 1886. He passed away in the key photographer of the Harlem Renaissance. And he was a self-taught portraitist um, he specialized in photographic portraits. For the most part, he was self-taught. And his usual subjects were Black, middle, and upper-class individuals that lived in Harlem. And you may recognize James Van Der Zee's work. We've talked about this photo quite a bit when we've been discussing the modern art. This is a couple in Harlem from 1932. And... Van der Zee was a key photographer during the Harlem Renaissance. So a lot of people have heard that term before. What exactly was the Harlem Renaissance? It was an intellectual and cultural revival of African-American art, dance, fashion, literature, music, theater, and politics centered in Harlem, New York's 1920s and early 1930s. And I wanted to give people some insight into these artists. Um, I'll be talking about them and showing you their works, but I really wanted you to also hear from these artists in their own words. Uh, and so for each of them, or at least most of them, uh, I tried to pull at least one quote so you can hear what they had to say about their art and their career. Um, so here's a great quote from James Vandersee, photographer. He said, I put my heart and soul into them meaning the portraits that he took, the photographic portraits that he took, and tried to see that every picture was better looking than the person. And here's our first example of his work that's at the Smithsonian. This particular photograph is in the collection of the Smithsonian American Art Museum. Again, the Smithsonian in Washington, D.C., there are two art museums under the same roof. There's the Smithsonian American Art Museum. There's also the Smithsonian National Portrait Gallery. Um, and they share the building. And so you can visit both of them at the same time. So this is called Evening Attire from 1922. It's a studio portrait. And remember, James Vandersee, his typical subjects were usually middle and upper uh, class members of the African American community that he was uh, living with and working with in Harlem. And his photographs are known for among other things, he frequently would use props and accessories to complement his photos. And so here's a beautiful photograph, a beautiful woman and you can see the props and accessories that she has here so furniture um, a little statuette some flowers and then of course in the background you have windows and things like that so really nicely done and here's a close-up of her and so people would visit james van der see's photographic studio and he would take their portraits. And then he would also um, hire himself out to do photographic portraits for different types of events and things like that. And he really ends up recording, um, almost like in a journalistic way, uh, kind of the happenings of Harlem with his photographic um, images of the people of Harlem. This is studio portrait of a young man with telephone, 1929. And again, you see the props and accessories. In this case, a telephone. Some flowers. 
and this is a really cool photo. This was a Christmas tree that he took a group portrait of. Um, it's a really interesting one because this particular photo has color tinting in it. You can see here, Christmas tree has been tinted. Um, and you see all these youngsters with their Christmas presents. They're all dressed up. Uh, and it's a really dynamic portrait. There's a lot going on. You could really spend a lot of time kind of studying all the faces and the children and their gifts and the tinting of the Christmas tree, et cetera, et cetera. And then here's a close up. And the full view. And then if you visit museums or art galleries, you'll periodically see James van der See's works and other museums. Uh, so I wanted to give you some examples of his works that you can find in other places. So here are three beautiful portraits. And the two that are at the Smithsonian, or two of the ones that are at the Smithsonian. All right, let's continue on. Our next artist is a sculptor by the name of Richmond Barté. And he was born in 1901, passed away in 1989. Many of the artists that we featured in our previous program and this one were part of the Great Migration where they left the Southern United States and moved to points north. Richmond is in that category. Uh, he and his family migrated from Mississippi to Chicago uh, he did this at the age of 23. Then later on, he would end up in New York City. Uh, he's a key sculptor of the Harlem Renaissance period. Patty says she loves the Christmas tree with kids photo. <laughs> Thanks, Patty. Appreciate that. Um, let's see. So here's a photograph, actually, of the artist. And he's posing with one of his sculptures. And then here's one of his works. This is called Blackberry Woman from 1930-1932. It's in the Smithsonian American Art Museum collection. And then this is actually in the collection of the National Portrait Gallery. We actually saw this artwork yesterday. So there was an artist named Betsy Graves Raynow and she actually did a portrait of Richmond Barté in 1946. It's a really great portrait. Um, he's standing there looking directly at us and there's a profile view of one of his sculptures. But the most famous work of his at the Smithsonian is this one. It's a bust sculpture of Booker T. Washington and it was cast in 1973. However, the original was made by the artist in 1946. And remember, um, he moved from Chicago to New York uh, in 1929. So this was done during his New York City period. Booker T. Washington was a famous educator, author, orator, et cetera, et cetera. Um, he was a very prominent individual. Um, and so Richmond ends up doing a... Uh, like a sculptor portrait of him, um, but he had to do it based on photographs. As you can see, Booker T. Washington passed away in 1915 and the sculpture was cast in 1946. So he based it on photographs, but it's really lifelike. I've seen the sculpture numerous times in person. Um, it's, if you go to the Smithsonian, it's usually on the first floor. It's near oftentimes like the Civil War galleries. And a side view. And then here's the artist with a patron of his discussing the sculpture and look at the size of it. So slightly larger than life size. And here's a quote from the artist on his works. All my life, I've been interested in trying to capture the spiritual quality I see and feel in people. And I feel that the human figure, as God made it, is the best means of expressing this spirit in man. And 
and there you have it. All right, this next artist is one of my favorites, and he's actually the subject of an upcoming Smithsonian Museum art exhibit. So if you're in Washington, D.C., you can actually go check out more works of this artist in, later on uh, this year. Actually, I think the exhibit opens um, in just a few weeks in early March. And this is William Henry Johnson, also known as William H. Johnson. And here's three works from him. He's a fascinating artist. I like um, his art is very distinctive. And there's kind of like two different, uh, say, phases of his career. I'll show you what I mean in just a moment. But I actually really like both phases, even though they're very, very different. And he did a lot of historical portraits. Talk about those in just a moment. All right, William H. Johnson, who was born in 1901. He passed away in 1970. He also was part of the Great Migration. He left South Carolina and moved to New York City to pursue his art career at the young age of 17. And he also was a part of the Harlem Renaissance. In fact, I would say that William H. Johnson was probably one of the key visual artists of the Harlem Renaissance, one of the more well-known figures. Um, and again, his style, it initially was categorized as expressionism, but then later on, he transitioned into folk art. I'll show you what I mean in just a moment. All right, so these six works are all by the same artist, William H. Johnson, and they're all part of the Smithsonian collection. Uh, the Smithsonian actually has dozens and dozens of Johnson's works. When he passed away, uh, the artist, he had a lot of his works were being stored in a storage unit, um, and the Smithsonian acquired that. And so they're, they have the largest collection of William H. Johnson's uh, paintings in the world, um, and they rotate that. Because the Smithsonian can see a lot of stuff. But how different these paintings on the top are compared to the ones on the bottom. And these are all the same artists. And so this particular uh, series up here, this is what's called his expressionism phase. And then later on, he transferred or transitioned to what could be called more of like a, a folk style. Folk style usually means, folk art usually means um, artists that were self-taught and they're oftentimes making artwork for kind of more, um, well, I don't know, just like uh, functional purposes uh, opposed to say, like say aesthetic purposes. And I really like this portrait a lot. This is young people in 28 to 1930. Uh, Johnson made this while he was living in Harlem. Um, and you can see this young man here. It's unfortunate we don't know who the identity of this person person is. If you have an answer that was a young pastry cook in Harlem in the late 1920s, who knows? Maybe this is one of your ancestors. Um, it's unfortunate there's so many famous portraits throughout history, not just American history, but European history, Asian history, uh, etc. So we don't know the uh, names of the subjects, and this is one example, but I really, really like this painting a lot. Um, and again, this is one of his early works. Notice the darker colors the expressionism style. And then here's the next one. This is Jim from 1930. Again, early work, darker colors, expressionism style. This is actually the artist's brother. And then here's a self-portrait with pipe from 1937. It's looking very dapper. Uh, you can notice he's got his paintbrush in his hand. And it looks like maybe he's wearing like a smoking type jacket. And he's got a pipe here, some nice colors in the background. All right, and then Johnson ends up kind of transitioning <laughs> over to more of a folk style. Um, along with being an artist, he also was an art teacher, and he really encouraged his students to 
experiment and try new things and see what they were comfortable with, uh, he ended up doing that himself. So he tries this kind of more folksy style uh, and he really liked it a lot. And he ends up uh, kind of his whole career style uh, really changes like the trajectory of it. Um, so this is Street Life in Harlem from the late 1930s. And you see a young couple here and very different than the works we saw just a moment ago. And then this is another interesting series of two portraits or two kind of more genre scenes. This is a cafe from 1939. Um, again, you have the folk style. Notice the very simplified patterns. Uh, one thing that's really interesting about this is Boy, there's a lot going on underneath the table because you have the table legs, his legs, her legs. Well, there's all these different uh, patterns and styles and diagonals and things going on underneath the table. And then there was a article in the New Yorker about Harlem that came out in 2016. And when I saw this cover, I was like, oh, look, they have William H. Johnson on the cover. So that caught my eye. And they're using that painting from the Smithsonian. And then here's a similar version, also in the folk style, and it has kind of these simplified patterns. Um, this is called High Life Harlem, 1939 Now that was, this painting is very similar to the one that we just saw a moment ago. Notice the gentleman clothing's changed. So he went from wearing a suit to army attire uh, because at this point in time, the United States hadn't entered World War I. Um, but things were getting scarier throughout the world. And I think a lot of people were considering it was just a matter of time before that ended up taking place. So interesting kind of compare and contrast with these two works by William H. Johnson. And here's another one, Seated Woman in a Flower Dress. And look at the bold colors on this one. White and blue and red, and yellow. And again, it's unfortunate that her name is not associated with the portrait. And then here's one of his more well-known works. This is Man in a Vest, 1939-1940. Again, these bold colors. Look at the background. Uh, the figure really stands out with his dark skin, the white shirt, the black vest, and you have this really bright yellow background. He's seated on a red chair. So some really great colors in here, some great contrast in this particular work. And look at his eyes. And then here's a cute painting. This is Wedding Couple, 1940. Uh, and again, for the most part, William H. Johnson, he focused on African-American subjects. Um, you see oftentimes community and family and things like that in his paintings. Um, so this is a really great example, young couple getting married. And again, in that kind of folk style. Here's another one, I baptize thee from sometime around 1940. And again, that kind of subject matter of community and family. All right, and then again, here's that kind of compare and contrast. So notice these early works of his, which I really like this style a lot. 
and how different they are to his later works, which I really also like that style a lot. So really interesting to see um, his career kind of pivot or change over the course of time. And then the other thing that Johnson is known for is he did a series of numerous portraits, many of them historical portraits, which he called the Fighters for Freedom series. Um, and so, for instance, in this particular instance, he's painting Marian Anderson. Uh, this painting was done around 1945. Marian Anderson, a uh, prominent person in Washington, D.C. history, she performed at the Lincoln Memorial in 1939. It's one of the most famous concerts of the 1900s and just so happened to take place in Washington, D.C. And you can see here kind of doing um, different things. So here's kind of like the main portrait of her in the center uh, and then in the background, kind of all these different places she visited and things she did, you know, Eiffel Tower, uh, meeting with Eleanor Roosevelt, et cetera, et cetera. And then this is another famous work by Johnson, Harriet Tubman. It's a historical portrait. Harriet Tubman, of course, had passed away long before Johnson had painted this work. So William H. Johnson painted his Fighters for Freedom series in the mid-1940s as a tribute to African-American activists, scientists, teachers, and performers, as well as international heads of state working to bring peace to the world. He celebrated their accomplishments even as he acknowledged the realities of racism, violence, and oppression they faced and overcame. Some of his fighters, Harriet Tubman, George Washington Carver, Marian Anderson, Mahatma Gandhi, are familiar historical figures, there are what, less well-known individuals whose determination and sacrifice have been eclipsed over time. Johnson elevates their lives, offering historical insights and fresh perspectives. Through their stories, he suggests that the pursuit of freedom is an ongoing interconnected struggle with moments of triumph and tragedy, and he invites us to reflect on our own struggles for justice today. In All Fighters for Freedom, Johnson reminds us that individual achievement and commitment to social justice are the heart of the American story. So I was kind of talking earlier about how this interplay between American history and American art, and this is a classic example. The painting that Johnson made was based on a portrait of Harriet Tubman that appeared in a biography that was written about her shortly after the end of the Civil War. And you can see he use that as the basis for his portrait, but took some artistic liberties with it. And a close-up. And a full view. Interesting, he has uh, the North Star Harriet Tubman would follow on her journeys to uh, free enslaved person. This is a cabin, would have been typical, uh, say in Maryland, places that she visited. Uh, here she is kind of like a young, strong woman, a rifle. Uh, notice the American flag kind of themed dress. Uh, and then here she is as an older woman. So really kind of interesting portrait where he's kind of combining a lot of different things. Uh, not too different than he did with this one of Marian Anderson. So really clever how he, um, his artwork is very different uh, depending on the time period and the subject and things like that. Um, but I really like all his different works. And then if you want to see this exhibit, it's called Fighters for Freedom, William H. Johnson Picturing Justice. It's, it's going to be at the Smithsonian American Art Museum in Washington, D.C. And look at this. It's going to open on uh, March 8th. 2024, so just in a few weeks, and it will run through the summer and close on September 8th of 2024. So if you get a chance, make sure you check out the Smithsonian and go see William H. Johnson. And here's some of his works in summary. All right, one of my favorite things to do in these programs is show artists that 
maybe someone not familiar with. Um, I really, really like this artist. This is Alan Rohan Kreit. And I really like these paintings. In fact, I like all of his works and I wish he was more well-known. He was really talented. So let's talk about these two paintings. Now, the reason why you might know, uh, not know about some of these artists is because, I don't know, they had different things going on. So like, for instance, Alan Rohan Kreit, he wasn't a full-time artist. He actually was a Boston shipyard draftsman. And he really just kind of made paintings and stuff, uh, kind of like on the weekends and at night and stuff. It was kind of more of a hobby of his because um, he had like a regular full-time job in the Boston shipyard as a draftsman. Um, but he's kind of getting more notoriety, so to speak. Um, in the past few years, he was born in 1910, passed away in 2007, and he really kind of considered himself a visual journalist. Uh, we'll talk about that in just a moment. And he really focused on us kind of depicting the lives of everyday people um, in neighborhoods around where he lived. And here's the first example of his work. This is called Schools Out from 1936. And you have these um, uh, women are coming to pick up the children. You have all the um, kids are out playing and stuff like that. And one thing that's really incredible, notice the date on this painting, 1936, what was going on. Then it was the heart of the Great Depression. Um, but yet in Rohan Kreitz's painting, he's using all vivid, bright colors. Um, so you wouldn't really know the depression is going on by looking at this painting. It's much more like a vibrant scene. Um, another thing that's really interesting is look at all these figures that are in this painting and every outfit, every hairstyle, uh, et cetera, et cetera, is unique. There aren't any two that are the same. Now on the right are examples of works the artist did during his daytime job. And this, um, how different they are from the painting on the left. Now you can see the skill. Wow, look at all these intricate drawings that he made uh, and diagrams and things like that. So you can really tell he's a talented artist. Um, but on the other hand, uh, look at how different it is to the painting. So you can kind of compare and contrast uh, the work that he was doing, say Monday through Friday, nine to five, and the work that he was doing at night on the weekend. And then here's a full view of the painting. Uh, so schools let out and the parents or maybe older sisters are coming to pick up the young girls at school. And this is in Boston. And here's a close up. And again, look at all these great colors. Uh, that's really kind of a signature thing that you see out of this particular artist's works. And just imagine the amount of time it would have taken to put all this together. I mean, this is a really intricate uh, painting with a lot going on. And, view. and here's a quote from this artist, Alan Rohan Kreit said, as a visual artist, I'm in the communicationist. I'm a storyteller of my view of the African-American experience in a local sense, the neighborhood, in a larger sense, a part of the total human experience. And then here's another work of his, it's a Smithsonian, Sunlight and Shadow, 1941. Uh, this is a park in South Boston, and he's another artist who frequently would focus on themes of community and family. Uh, we saw that in the previous painting. Uh, we see both in that work, and we see both in this one. So you have a series of women here and young girls, um, and they're sitting in a park. It looks like they're, you know, talking and, um, you know, interacting with one another, et cetera, et cetera. A lot of great colors here. Um, he's got the neighborhood in the background. So just a really interesting, really kind of complex um, composition here, which um, kind of makes sense just because we saw that the work that he was doing for the uh, shipyard in Boston. And then if you want to see some other examples of his work. So for some of these artists, I wanted to show you other um, examples of their work that aren't the Smithsonian, just so you can get kind of a sense of what other things that they do. Because if you see, like, say, five examples of an artist, you can get kind of a more appreciation of what they did during their career, be to see, say, one or two. Um, so here's some other works of his that are at different collections. 
And again, you can see these themes of uh, African-American community and families and things like that. All right, here's another great artist. This is Romare Bearden. He was born in 1911. He passed away in 1988. I saw there was um, one or two people from North Carolina. Romare Bearden was actually from North Carolina. Uh, he, along with his family, moved to New York when he was five years old. Um, he also a key figure of the Harlem Renaissance, and he was a big music lover. So you frequently see music incorporated into his works. And I used to work at the Detroit Institute of Arts. And this is a beautiful mosaic that they have by Romare Bearden. Uh, it's really massive. These figures are life size. Um, and really incredible to see this up close and in person. The pictures don't do it justice. Uh, so there's one example of his work that's at a museum, not called the Smithsonian. Um, and then here's a couple other examples of his work. And you can see the music uh, being interjected is subject matter. And that's what he ended up doing here. This is called The Empress of the Blues from 1974. He's depicting jazz age Harlem and in particular, Bessie Smith. So Bessie Smith, jazz age Harlem. Look at the beautiful colors on this one. And again, really complex composition here. And it's kind of got like a mosaic kind of feel to it, although it's actually an oil painting or it's got kind of also like a collage type feel to it as well. Now in Harlem in the 1920s and 1930s, this is known as the jazz age. And there was a lot of musical entertainment. One of the more well-known places, was, of course, the Cotton Club. And one of the prominent performers that you would see during this time, boy, it'd be incredible to go back in a time machine and get to see this type of uh, entertainment or experience in person. Uh, one of the key figures of this era was Bessie Smith. And you can see here Time Magazine. And here she is on the cover back in 1923, Bessie Smith. And she was known as the Empress of the blues and so that was the title of this painting so this is a historical portrait of bessie smith romare well, appeared in the artist taking us back in time and you may recall or if you don't know uh there was a movie made about bessie smith starring queen latifah uh, so if you want to learn more about her you should check the film out it's really really good uh, i've seen it before a couple times liked it a lot. Uh, Bessie Smith had a really fascinating life. She had a really big influence on American music. And Queen Latifah does a great job portraying her. Um, now, going back to this painting, look at all this. Remember before we were talking about um, all the kind of things that are going on, a uh, really kind of complex composition. You really have that here. Uh, notice the great colors with the yellow and the red and the blue and the green. Just really an incredible painting here by Romare Bearden. And you can almost hear the music being performed. And here's a close up. And a couple quotes from Omer Bearden. You don't paint what you see, you paint what you feel. And then another instance, he said, you should always respect what you are and your culture, because if your art is going to mean that is from. And there he is in his studio. And the painting again. I really like this artwork, uh, American art, whether it's African-American art or any other um, type of group. American art, boy, it really changes a lot. I mean, we've only seen a few artists um, and we've seen a real variety of subjects um, and styles and that if you say contrast that with like, uh, I don't know, French Impressionism, uh, you know, it can be kind of similar after a while, even though there's great differences there as well. But one thing that's really fascinating about American art is how varied it is uh, from artist to artist. And that's Romare Bearden. All right. 
our next two artists are Malvin Gray Johnson and Earl Richardson. We're going to talk about them together. Melvin Gray Johnson made the two paintings on the left. Earl Richardson made the painting on the right. Uh, two artists that aren't well known, but they passed away at young ages. And so that um, kind of limited their artistic output. So here is Melvin Gray Johnson, born in 1896. He passed away in 1934. He died suddenly of heart failure. Uh, he also was part of the Great Migration. Boy, there's, I should go back and see what percentage of the artists we talked about during this two-part series that were part of the Great Migration. It was substantial. Um, he's also a key visual artist of the Harlem Renaissance. And one of his famous works is a self-portrait that he did, 1934. He was really interested in African and he frequently would include them in his artwork in different ways or in others. You can see back here, there's uh, depictions of two men. I really like this cool shirt that he's wearing and a lot of great colors in this one as well. And then here's another work. So Malvin took a trip down to Charlottesville, Virginia from New York. And, well, one summer. And he ended up painting these two, painting these two brothers, 1934. And you can see kind of some similarities and some contrast between these two works. So the artist is on the right, and then two brothers that he came across on the left. And then again, some examples of other works outside the Smithsonian. Um, just so you can maybe, oh yeah, I really like this artist. I wanted to learn more about them or see more of their stuff. So here's some other examples of Malvin Gray Johnson's works that are in collections outside the Smithsonian. So you can really get kind of a feel of what he's all about. And here's the African masks. Here's a great portrait of a sailor, et cetera, et cetera. And then here's Earl Richardson. He was born in 1912. He passed away in 1935. He also was part of the Harlem Renaissance. Um, and we're gonna talk about his relationship with Malvin Gray Johnson in just a moment. And here's a great work that he made. It's called Employment of Negroes in Agriculture from 1934. It's his most famous painting and was part of a series that he called the Southern Life Series. Um, so Richardson is based in Harlem, but he's doing depictions of African-Americans working in agricultural type endeavors in the Southern United States. Uh, these particular people are picking cotton. And notice how they're depicted. Um, I've never actually picked cotton, but I've seen it done and uh, my Great, great grandparents actually picked cotton in Texas uh, a long time ago. They were cotton farmers and they they moved to Detroit because it was too hard of a way to make a living. Um, and you just hear stories and read depictions of this, how backbreaking and brutal this work was. Um, but notice here, um, he's depicting these workers as they're strong and they're noble and regal. And, you know, they're standing um, you know, uh, at attention here and, you um, the beautiful colors and he's got the cotton field in the background. So again, really dynamic kind of complex uh, composition here. And this was an endeavor that Earl Richardson was working on with Malvin Gray Johnson. So you can see uh, Malvin did kind of a similar depiction. He's actually got the workers uh, stooped over um, here. A lot of these agricultural type tasks uh, were really backbreaking. Um, and so he's got to really he approach things Malvin did very differently than the way Earl did. Um, so kind of interesting to compare and contrast their two styles. If you're familiar with Thomas Hart Benton, um, this work kind of reminds me of some of the things that he did. The, the forms are very simplified. Um, you have these beautiful colors.
And here's the two side by side. Now, um, again, some of these artists you might not have heard of before, might not be familiar with. Um, and sometimes there's reasons for that. Um, previous artists, we were talking about the fact that he was only like a, a part-time a painter, the other time he was uh, working for the Naval Shipyard. These two artists you might not have heard of before because they both died young. So Malvin Gray Johnson, he died of heart failure. Earl Richardson were in a romantic relationship. And when Mark Malvin died suddenly in 1934, Earl was so distraught uh, that his lover had died that he his life by suicide. Um, and so unfortunately he passed away in 1935. And so two very talented artists, uh, their careers tragically cut short, but I wanted to share their works with you just so you can get more, learn more about them. All right, let's talk about Huey Lee Smith. And Huey is from my hometown, Detroit, in fact, he went to my dad's alma mater, Wayne State University, if you know where that is. Wayne State is in the heart of Detroit. It's right across the street from my former employer, the Detroit Institute of Arts. Uh, he's a really cool artist. He focused on American realism and surrealism, born in 1915, passed away in 1999. So shout out to Detroit. And let's check out Huey Lee Smith's artwork. This is The Stranger from 1957 and 1958. His paintings frequently feature alienation and isolation. Uh, usually he's not depicting like rich people or wealthy people, kind of every man kind of thing. They all, his paintings frequently have like a Edward Hopper-esque type of quality to them. Let's see what I mean in more in just a moment. And so you have this figure and these buildings in the background. And then here's another one. This is the beach from 1962. And again, to me, this is, everyone's kind of can see their own thing when, when they look at art, but whenever I see his work, I immediately think of Edward Hopper. And so you, it's interesting here, you have this woman and there's a baby, um, but yet they're kind of in this very barren landscape. And then over here in the distance is these buildings, but she looks like she's a long ways away from those. Uh, she's separated from them water um, so they're kind of the buildings are kind of close by um, but yet at the same time they're very very far away so really interesting painting from him and then here's an interesting one also in my opinion kind of Hopper-esque the confrontation from 1970 and Hopper was a real master at kind of giving us a story um, but only partially so, and leaving us to fill in the details. And so that's kind of the, the same thing here, like what's going on with this painting? So there's these two young girls, um, they're near this water. Um, you know, what is this brick wall here that's partially demolished? Um, you know, the two girls, they're close to one another, but yet they're not uh, really interacting with each other. Why is that? Um, so, you know, he kind of gives you some visual clues as to what's going on but doesn't really tell you much of the story uh, and really kind of leaves it up to your own interpretation. So that's Huey Lee Smith. Let's talk about this artist, Elier Couture. He's really fascinating as well. He's born in Passed away in 2015. This part two, mostly focusing on uh, focusing on artists that were born 1900. Also part of the Great Migration, um, he immigrated from Virginia to Chicago with his family. He was only one year old. Um, he was part of the Harlem Renaissance. Most of the Harlem Renaissance took place in Harlem, but there were several artists that were in other um, locations in Chicago. Uh, even though that was not part of Harlem, or usually artists from that era that are African-American or black kind of oftentimes categorized as part of the um, Harlem style. Um, and he usually focused his subject matter on women. 
And this is a Southern Gate of 1942. He oftentimes would depict women as uh, being beautiful and see that as you look at his um, works. In fact, let's go back. Okay, so here's three of his works. Uh, notice kind of the similarities uh, and the contrast between these three. And this is a really interesting painting because it's got a lot of visual references to, say, um, a triumph over the South, the old South. And this painting actually made him famous because it was profiled in Life Magazine, 1946. So here was Life Magazine. At the time, it was one of the two most popular magazines in the United States, so the one in time. You can see the date here, July 1946. That would be quite featured in life. And that's what happened. They did a whole series of, they profiled Black American art. Here's a example of six of the works that they featured. And here was the facing page of the article. You can see it says Negro artists their works win top U.S. honors. And so look, here's his painting in Life magazine. And he was really young at the time, so that was quite an accomplishment. Now, I think for uh, Americans, exactly people living in this era, uh, they really kind of focus or kind of get hung up on the nudity thing. But if you kind of go back in time, uh, a lot of Americans, particularly today, they kind of equate nudity with sexuality. You, you know, sometimes that's a legitimate thing, but sometimes uh, not so much. Like Angelo's David um, prominently features nudity from, say, 440 years earlier. Yes, um, this is not an American painting. It's a French painting, but we talk about this in our program about the Louvre. Um, this is like one of the French history. Um, and notice this woman uh, as nudity um, associated with her pose in here. Um, and so that's kind of what's going on this on the right. And then I remember yesterday in the program in part one, we were talking about Horace Pippin and how he made this painting as kind of a response to Gone with the Wind. Gone with the Wind uh, film came out in 1939. Um, and while it was popular in kind of mainstream America, uh, there was a really kind of backlash to it, um, in particular the American. So Pippin makes this painting, and not long thereafter, uh, Couture makes this painting in 1942. And it's kind of like a direct response to go on with the wind. See this, like the old South in the background, with the plantation, et cetera, et cetera. And really, again, the, the, the portrayal of African-Americans in film and in different media um, and you know, the Con with the Wind, probably, you know, already know about that, so we don't have to go into that great detail, but just to give you that historical context. And so if you look at the background, the painting, the symbolism, uh, the plantation, and so in the background, there's this river, you know, crossing the river. Um, you notice she's got a cross. Uh, there's a church in the background, uh, there's flowers, a mockingbird. Uh, some people have kind of equated her to Eve. Uh, so uh, the artist kind of gives us some of these visual clues and lets us kind of um, fill in the blank, so to speak. And you can kind of interpret this any way you want to. And here's a close-up. And full view. And if you like this painting, this is one of my favorites. This is classical study number 34 from 1968. So quite a bit later. This is really a celebration of black women. Uh, and this came out during the Black is Beautiful era in American history. And same artist. And here's a quote from the artist. The black woman represents the black race. She is the black spirit. She conveys a feeling of eternity and a continuance of life.
And again, this came out in 1968. And then this was part of a series of works that he did. Um, and so I wanted to show you a couple other examples. So these two are not at the Smithsonian, uh, but you can see the similarities. So this again was part of a, a series. He called this his classical study series. Robert, your voice is cutting oh, out quick, oh, pretty far. Sorry about that. Let no, that's all right. That. And then you'll notice here the Pan African flag, green, red, and yellow. All right, dance composition number 31. Thanks, Patty. I appreciate that. No problem. And then here's another one, figure composition number two, 1982. And the review of the works we saw. All right, let's continue on. Let's talk about Jacob Lawrence. Uh, he's perhaps the most famous African-American artist of the 1900s. And the Smithsonian has several works of his. So Jacob Lawrence, he was born in 1928. He passed away in 1987. Also a key figure of the Harlem Renaissance. Uh, he's most well known for his migration series. Uh, and he has an interesting story. He took part in an after-school art program that really helped launch his career. And so you might remember, if you saw the program yesterday, we talked about Augusta Savage. And she was an artist. She also was an educator in Harlem. And she ends up being the teacher of numerous well-known, prominent, important artists. Um, so Augusta Savage. Not she's a key figure uh, in her own right as an artist, but she also plays a really important role uh, in being a teacher and mentor of, an, of, of important artists. And one of her students just so happened to be a young gentleman by the Lawrence, uh, and he was really indebted to Augusta Savage for the remainder of his career. He said, "For you, Augusta Savage." of many of us in the Harlem community. She liked us, the young people. She worked with the young people and she took us. I was one of those fortunate enough to have her take an interest in me. And she thought that I had the talent. And he certainly did because he went on to have a great career. Uh, this is a photograph of Jacob Lawrence from 1940. And that was a key time for him because that's when his migration series came out and overnight he became really, really famous. And the migration series, one of the great um, series of paintings in American history. I won't talk about that too much because it's not part of the Sasoni, but just so you know, um, kind of what his background was. And that was featured in Fortune Magazine in 1941 and brought a lot of fame to Jacob Lawrence. And so let's work, look at some works that he did after that. This is called Bar and Grill from 1941. This is a really interesting painting. It depicts the Jim Crow segregation uh, in the South and the division between white and black. And what happened, Lawrence traveling, I think if I'm not mistaken, he was in New Orleans um, and he saw the Jim Crow segregation firsthand and he wanted to capture it in his artwork. And so he ends up doing so. Um, so, okay, so this is the white section of the establishment. This is the black section. Uh, notice this section has a ceiling fan. Uh, there's the wall here separating them. Uh, you know, the bartender, he's kind of paying uh, his time over here, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so just really interesting compare and contrast between the segregation that Florence is depicting. And this response to separate but equal.
I think for me, the ceiling fan is the one that <laughs> really um, helps differentiate too. And then this big wall. And then Lawrence, during World War II, was a member of the United States Coast Guard. And he ends up doing a portrait of his captain. This is Captain Skinner from 1944. Again, Lawrence, World War II, was a member of the East Coast Guard. And here is a photograph of Captain Skinner. He and Lawrence got along uh, very well. Um, Jacob Lawrence had a lot of respect and admiration for him uh, and vice versa. Carlton Skinner also really liked Jacob Lawrence a lot. And he actually had this painting in his collection. Um, the captain did. And then when he passed away, the family donated to Smithsonian. So that's pretty cool. And a photograph of Jacob Lawrence by Arnold A. Newman, taken in 1959. And then as for Lawrence's migration series, he spent a lot of time in libraries in Harlem uh, learning about Black history and studying it so that he could better portray it um, in the Great Migration series. And so he kind of wanted to give thanks to the fact of all the knowledge that he had gained uh, from libraries. And so he ends up making this painting called The Library um, and then said Black history um, Lawrence was to say, never study seriously like regular subjects, was a quote from the artist. So he had to study this on his own. And one of the establishments that Lawrence studied at um, is now known as the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture at Harlem, New York City. And Lawrence has a very distinctive style. And a lot of great colors and also the simplified forms. He was working on a project where he was doing uh, depictions of the different states in the United States. The particular one is New Jersey. And Lawrence was born in New Jersey, but he moved to Harlem at the age of 13. And here's another quote from him. My belief is that most important for an artist to develop an approach and philosophy about life. If he has developed this philosophy, he does not put paint on canvas. He puts himself on canvas. This is a really neat one. This is called Dreams Number 2 from 1965. Uh, interesting, the depiction of weddings here. Uh, and then also the use of windows. So big day in people's lives when they get married. And so this is called dream. So what you have here probably uh, is a woman here and she's sitting on a chair and perhaps she's dreaming about her own wedding someday. Um, and then Lawrence is using these two windows, uh, kind of like a window into her dreams of things that she's looking out at. Or dreaming about or thinking about. Hannah says, reminds me of Chagall, Mark Chagall. Um, here's another interesting painting. This is called Confrontation on the Bridge from 1975. This painting was a response to the Selma to Montgomery marches that had taken place the previous decade. Uh, and you see this wolf over here, the big bad wolf, and the figures here on the bridge. And so the Selma to Montgomery marches took place in 1965. And this was a confrontation among the local authorities and the civil rights movement, and it turned violent. And so notice Lawrence here again, he's got the ferocious looking wolf 
on this one side of the bridge and these people on the other side and they're trying to get across this river of some sort. Uh, rivers and art oftentimes are used metaphorically. And you can see the drama in their faces. And again, really great colors in his works. I hope that when my life ends, I would have added a little beauty, perception, and quality for those who follow, said Jacob Lawrence. And he certainly did. All right, let's talk about Gordon Parks, great American photographer. And not only was he a photographer, he was a film director. So Gordon Parks, one of the most famous photographers in American history, uh, certainly one of the most famous photographers of the 1900s. And he also was a film director. You probably are familiar with at least one of the films he directed because it was Shaft, great American classic from the early 1970s. Gordon Parks uh, transitioned from being a photographer to a film director. And if you don't recognize his name, you probably recognize a lot of his works, either photographic works, film works, et cetera, et cetera. I'm a really fascinating individual, someone that uh, if you don't know a lot about, you should spend more time studying him. Here's a photograph of him uh, taken by a friend of his in 1945. And he made a number of iconic photos during the 1900s. This particular one, American Gothic, uh, one of the most famous photographs in American history. And then here's a great one depicting segregation in the Jim Crow South. So these are not at the Smithsonian, but I wanted to give you a sense of what Garden Parks was all about. Um, let's look at some of his photos that are at the Smithsonian. So here's Malcolm X from 1963. I love the how the um, you know Malcolm X famous guy uh, and these two people just kind of casually just walking right past him. Then here's Muhammad Ali. Nineteen sixty six, and Stokey Carmichael from nineteen sixty seven. Gordon Parks. I was going to do a separate program on Gordon Parks um, someday in the future. So we'll continue on with him at a later date. And then this program isn't just about African-American or Black artists. Um, we're also including images of Blacks and African-Americans that were done by people of other races. Um, because there's a number of really cool or important or noteworthy artworks um, done by other individuals. And so let's look at some of those. Uh, this is Robert Vickery. Uh, he did a portrait of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. in 1963. This is one of the more famous images of King. And this ended up being on the cover of Time Magazine. And so you can see the original artwork on the left, Time Magazine cover on the right. And this is when Dr. King earned Time Magazine's Man of the Year award. And thus the image, the artwork became very well known. And then here's another famous image of Dr. King that also appeared on the cover of Time Magazine. And this was shortly after King's I Have a Dream speech. There was a time when Time Magazine uh, used original artwork on their covers. Um, they've since gone to using photographs. It's faster and less expensive and easier. Um, but I really, really like all these old Time Magazine covers where they would use original artwork. There's a really a lot of great portraits. And Time Magazine was actually kind enough to donate a lot of these original artworks from their collection to the Smithsonian. Uh, so the Smithsonian has a lot of great portraits.
of Americans from say the early uh, to late 1900s that are based on these Time Magazine covers. And then here's Marshall Rumbaugh, and he did a sculpture of Rosa Parks in 1983. And this is depicting Rosa's arrest, which took place on December 1st, 1955. And this is painted lime wood. And the front and back. So this is a really interesting sculpture. Uh, notice Rosa Parks, she's dressed white and blue. Um, she's the three-dimensional figure. Uh, these two guys represent uh, the authorities of the establishment. They're two-dimensional. Um, <laughs> and he's got the gun. The figure on the left has got the gun in the back. It might be hard to see, but this gentleman has an American flag on his lapel. And so interesting depiction there. And they're towering over her, but she's holding strong. And then here's a really interesting work. This is by Jane Dixon. And this is Fab Five Freddy from 1982. Um, if you remember back in the early hip hop days, uh, there was a show called Yo MTV Raps in 1988 that featured Fab Five Freddy and Jane Dickinson did this really cool portrait of him. All right, let's talk about another great artist, Micheline Thomas. Uh, I think when some people think of art museums, they think of artists that are no longer alive, but that's not always the case. So Micheline Thomas, uh, she's born in Newark, New Jersey, but she's now a Brooklyn-based artist. Um, and she does mixed media portraits. And usually her portraits focus on African-American women, and here are some examples of her works. And here's Oprah from 2007 or 2008. It's a screen print with rhinestones. Oprah Winfrey, of course, at her show from 1986 to 2011. And look at the beautiful smile on Oprah. And there's the full view. And then this was the first portrait that Michelle Obama sat for when Barack was elected president back in 2008. And then and this is her work that I wanted to focus on. It's called Portrait of Monosia from 2010. And before COVID, I used to lead tours of the Smithsonian. And I got to tell you, this is one of the most popular works in the whole entire collection. It's really big. Um, and it's got these really incredible colors. And so we walk into this modern art gallery section of the Smithsonian and people see like, wow, what is that? Um, so it's really cool. So the artist met this young woman at a party um, and she thought she had a really interesting and distinctive look. And so she asked if she would pose for her, which she agreed to do. Um, notice she's also wearing red, white, and blue. And she was an immigrant from West Africa. Um, and notice she's got the interesting pose here and you know, got these objects in the background and all these different cool patterns. And a close up. And the artist, when she was a art student, was trying to figure out how to kind of like jazz up her artwork, so to speak. Um, and so she went to Michael's and got these like rhinestone type, uh, stones and objects and she put them in glitter and stuff like that. And she put it in her artwork and she thought it was a really interesting, unique effect, which it is. Um, and she's used it ever since. So that's pretty neat. And then look at her shoes. Oftentimes people, when they see the painting in person, comment on those. And her face. And the full view. 
And then here are some other works by Micheline Thomas. I like her work a lot and wanted to show you some other examples of what she's done. And perhaps you can go study her in more detail. And here's a quote from her. There's a greater power and charisma when a woman is aware of her sexual prowess, when it's not necessarily about victimization or someone else's pleasure, but her own feeling about her own body and understanding and loving herself. Quote from Nicolene Thomas, Brooklyn-based artist, and her work at the Smithsonian, which is one of the most popular artworks in their collection which is really saying something because they have a pretty amazing, extensive collection. But again, <laughs> when, when I used to uh, give tours of the Sasonian, you know, there's a lot of works, of course, that people like, but there's like a handful, like, I don't know, 10 or 20 that people really just like, wow, look at that. Uh, and this is one of them. All right, let's talk about the portraits of Barack and Michelle Obama. And here they are being unveiled. So the Smithsonian has this fabulous and incredible collection of the presidents and first ladies portraits, not just the Obamas, but everybody going all the way back from George and Martha Washington up into Donald and Melania Trump. The policy is they don't um, portray the portraits of the sitting uh, president and first lady. So they have George Washington, Martha Washington, uh, all the presidents and first ladies, all the way up to Donald and Melania Trump. Uh, they don't have Joe Biden or Dr. Joe Biden just yet, but at some point in time they will. And the Michelle Obama portrait was done by Amy Sherald. She's also a living artist, and she's from Baltimore, Maryland, which is about 40 or 45 minutes north of Washington, D.C., if there's no traffic. And here's her portrait. Um, and again, when I used to take people on tours in person at the Smithsonian. Um, the two most common reactions to this portrait was, number one, oh, wow, I've loved this. I've always loved it. I'm so glad to see it in person. And then there was another group that was like, you know what? I never was really crazy about this portrait when I saw it, uh, pictures of it. But now that I see it in person, I really like it a lot. Um, and I can't tell you how many people told me uh, either of those two options. This is from 2018 when they were unveiled. And here's some other examples of Amy Sherald's work against the Baltimore-based artist. And her style is very distinctive. And a couple more examples. And here's a portrait she did of Breonna Taylor or Vanity Fair. And then here's the portrait being unveiled at the Smithsonian in 2018. Michelle Obama on the left, Amy Sherald on the right, the portrait in the middle. And then, I don't know if you remember this, but um, this young girl <laughs> uh, seeing the portrait for the first time these photos went viral. And that was at the Smithsonian. And here's a quote from the artist. I paint American people and I tell American stories through the paintings I create. The dress that Michelle Obama was wearing was inspired by a fashion show that took place in Italy. So how about that? And if you get a chance to go to Washington, D.C., the Smithsonian National Portrait Gallery, it's not on the National Mall. It's kind of more like, say, downtown Washington, D.C., but you really should check it out. It's incredible to see all these uh, portraits, in particular, the presidents and first ladies' portraits are really amazing. And then here's Barack's portrait done by a different artist. And his portrait was done by Kehinde Wiley, who's also still alive. And the portrait was done in 2018. 
Now, it'll be interesting to see as time passes uh, what will end up being the most famous image of Barack Obama, like say, I don't know, 20 years from now or 50 years from now or 100 years from now. I kind of wonder if it'll be this hope image, which came out uh, in 2008 during his presidential campaign. Uh, this is done by Shepard Ferry. He actually, the artist donated this um, artwork to the Smithsonian. So they have that on display. And then, of course, there's the official presidential portrait. Um, so really kind of interesting compare and contrast there. And here's the artist, born in 1977. And his style is also very distinctive. He's known for having these really intricate backgrounds, which actually, let me go back for a minute. Let's look at Amy Sherald's other works. Notice her backgrounds. Okay, so this is Amy Sherrill, the one who painted Michelle Obama. Look at her backgrounds. And then fast forward, look at Kehinde Wiley's background. So they take very different approaches, which is really interesting, seeing as how one painted the president and one painted the first lady. And then here's some more works of his. This particular one on the left is at the Detroit Institute of Arts. My friends in Detroit. And then if you go to the portrait gallery, they actually have another one of his works. It's at, um, it's upstairs. It's LL Cool J. And you can see the comparison and contrast between LL Cool J and Barack Obama. And here's his portrait being unveiled. And the artist said, Art is about changing what we see in our everyday lives and representing it in such a way that it gives us hope. The background in this features flowers that were in places that Barack Obama lived. So Indonesia, and Hawaii, and Kenya, and Chicago, and stuff like that. Uh, so if you're wondering what the vegetation in the background is, it's flowers that were in places that Barack Obama lived during his life. And there they are, Barack and Michelle Obama. All right, so this has been the Smithsonian Black and African American Art Tour, part one and part two. Uh, I have a few more things to go over. Um, let's see. So I did a long time ago, not long time, like two or three years ago, I did a whole program. I think it's like 18 minutes on this Colin Powell portrait that's at the Smithsonian. Um, so if you want to check it out, it's on our YouTube channel. So our YouTube channel, our flagship YouTube channel is called Washington, D.C. History and Culture. Um, if you want to go learn about this really cool Colin Powell portrait, um, you can check that out there. Um, and this particular program is being recorded for YouTube and we'll post it on there probably tomorrow or Monday. So you can be on the lookout for that. And here's our flagship YouTube channel. It's really flattering. Our two YouTube channels, Washington, D.C. History and Culture and Texas History and Culture, have had over a million views since they were launched. So thank you very much. That's very flattering. Greatly appreciate that. And then what's up? With future American art programs. Well, I'm studying the collection at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. Uh, they probably have the world's greatest American art collection and I'm going to be doing an art trip to New York City, hopefully later this summer. And so I thought, you know what? We should start checking out their artwork. So you'd be on the lookout for our American art series. It'll be a multi series of programs on American art from the colonial era all the way up into modern times. That's gonna feature the artworks at the Metropolitan Museum of Art New York. Not sure what dates that'll be, but it'll be coming soon. Yeah, look out for that. And then if you're in Texas and wanna go see art and history and culture and stuff in person, uh, you should come visit us in Texas History and Culture. Uh, we do in-person events in Dallas, Fort Worth, and Austin, Texas. So for instance, on Saturday, March 2nd, we're going on a tour of Freedman Cemetery and West Village. Uh, actually, today in Dallas, we were at the George Bush, George W. Bush Presidential Library Museum. We had a tour there. That was really fun. 
Um, and then later on in March, on March 9th, we'll be down in Austin and we'll be going on a walk along Lady Bird Lake. And we'll be going on a tour of the Texas State Capitol. So you can find us about that. Just Google Texas History and Culture. You can find us on um, Meetup, Facebook, Eventbrite, et cetera. And let me do this. So I was going to play a video clip of the Obama portraits uh, being unveiled. So before I do that, though, I have to stop the recording because for copyright purposes, I can't um, record somebody else's recording. So um, if you're watching us live on Zoom, sit tight. I have a couple of videos to show you. If you're watching this recorded program, that'll be the end of the recording. Uh, I want to thank everyone for joining us and have a great evening. So if you're watching live, they'll hold on for just one moment.